to Before the Bell. My name is Todd Grisham here in South Florida as we get you set for tonight's main event at the Hard Rock Resort and Casino in Hollywood, Florida between Liam Williams, the challenger, squaring off against Demetrius Andrade for a part of the middleweight championship of the world. And joining me to discuss the man that made it all happen, Eddie Hearn, who spent all his money on this card and has no money left for professional clothes, I see. I just, I'm so embarrassed. I've just looked at the, the monitor there and just seen how bad I look. I mean, I love a freebie. Obviously, I picked this one up from Canelo this week. But with the shorts, just terrible. Yeah. Absolutely terrible. And, and tonight, I'll be getting dressed up for a great card. And I'm looking forward to it, particularly the main event. Last time we saw you in pajamas. Is that what you're going to be wearing tonight as well? Um, no, I'm going to be in a suit tonight. But I like to mix it up. Um, although, people keep reminding me I'm 41. It's quite depressing. Mm -hmm. Someone sent me a pair of ripped jeans, and I tried them on. And... It just can't be done anymore, Todd. You know. It looked good, but you didn't have the you didn't have the balls to wear it out, did you? All right. Well, you can do. You're in South Florida. You can wear pretty much whatever you wear, including that Borat G-string with the flip. I'll leave that one to you. Man. Let's talk about the main event. Mm. Liam Williams coming over here, looking for a knockout. He's not going to take a step back against Demetrius Andrade. How do you see it playing out? I can't wait. Actually, in the UK, people are really excited about this fight. I think in the US. You know, there's that frustration with Demetrius Andre. When's he going to fight another champion? When's he going to get his breakout fight? But us guys in the UK know what Liam Williams can do. He's the mandatory challenger. He's extremely aggressive. He can punch. He wants it bad. And I think it's going to be a great fight. I think he could have a perfect style for Demetrius Andre, who, you know, is a very crafty counter puncher. He's very slick as well. But he will have Williams on his chest, in his face, for as long as he can stay in there. I think it could go late, this fight. I think it could be a little bit dirty. Um, and Demetrius is going to be have to be switched on. But it's a bit edgy, isn't it? I mean, you were with the guys yesterday. You see Demetrius, I think, in his previous performance, previous flights, he was a bit flat. He, he's usually more chill in the build-up. Yeah. This time he's riled up. Yeah, which should be a good thing. You know, has Liam Williams got to him? I don't know. But he needs to make a statement because... You know, later in this show, we'll be joined by, of course, his number one fan, Chris Mannix. <laughs> and we all want those big fights, you know, Golovkin, Charlo, those unification fights. But you kind of need to sort of shout from the rooftops off the back of a great performance. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of his performances have been, I mean, he's hardly lost a round in four fights. But he sort of starts fast, looks great, and then you're just looking for that next gear to kick in. With Liam Williams, he may not have to go looking for that gear because Williams will be in his face, for, like I said, for as long as he can, he can be in the fight. We hear you give these kind of pep talks. Do you ever sit your fighters down and have these conversations with them? And did you tell Andre something like this? And what did he say? It's difficult, isn't it? Because we know how tough the sport is. Like, it's easy for us to sit there or me to bowl into a changing room and go, hey, Demetrius, come on, mate, you need to step on the gas. If you go back to the Seleski fight in Providence, you know, this is another thing. Demetrius, oh, the guy just doesn't sell. We had 9,000 people there at Providence. It was wild. He knocks Suleski down in the first round, and his dad, Paul, says, hey, calm down. Just box him. Get behind a jab. And me, I'm going, don't get behind a jab. Be reckless. Knock him out and get everyone talking. But when there's a sport that's as dangerous as this is, Paul Andrade will probably be saying to me, you keep your mouth shut. That's my son. He's going to go in there and school everybody. But this is the entertainment business. This is the fight game, and we need him to shine. A lot of people talk a good game against Demetrius Andrade. They get in there, and then after two or three rounds, they go into a shell. Williams won't go into a shell. I promise you that. So I'm looking for a really dominant performance from Andrade. Hopefully a performance where, at the end of the fight, we can say, Charlo, come on, Montiel, whoever you're fighting, what is this? You know, you talk about you want to create a legacy. You talk about you want to unify the division. Here's a champion that's not going to overprice himself. It's two great American fighters unifying the middleweight division. But first things first, he's got to deal with Liam Williams. All right. Besides the main event, what fight are you most excited to see tonight? 
you know what? It's a really, really well-matched card. No sort of standout superstars yet on the card, but Carlos Gongora, who we saw in probably one of my favourite all-time fights against Ali Akhmadov, which, of course, was behind closed doors. We do have fans back in the hard rock tonight. That was a tremendous fight. Christopher Pearson, his opponent, good, solid American fighter who's a very, very good amateur, fancies it this week, and I think that's going to be a great fight. Look out for the heavyweight fight between Majidov and Fedosov, you know, two guys that can really punch. Majidov, a, a fantastic amateur, world amateur champion, and Fedosov's a kind of who wants to fight him kind of guy. But three of our really bright young prospects all step up in really good fights. Arthur Biaslanov is in a tough fight against Israel Mercado, nine wins, seven knockouts. Otha Jones stepped up against Castaneda, I think he's 14-1. Um, and also Alexis Espino in with a guy who's 6-0 and with six knockouts. I love to see these young guys coming up to crunch time because they've had their easy fights. They've had their easy work. Now it's time to see if they can go on to the next level. For Carlos Gongoro, who became the first Ecuadorian to ever win a world title, if he wins tonight, what plans do you have for him going forward? I just think that it's a great story. You know, it's a guy who took a, took a fight at three weeks' notice against Akhmadov, who nobody wanted to fight. You know, he was getting bashed up, wasn't he, in the early part of that fight. A massive favorite back, in that fight. It, but he was getting beaten, comprehensively beaten, and he hung in there, hung in there. And the, the, the ending in the 12th round was thrilling. So he's a guy that says, you know, I want Canelo Alvarez. I want Plant. I want these other champions. He's just got to keep winning. You know, he's become a little bit of a hero in his, his home country, and he's a, he's a lovely guy, and he can really fight. And Pearson's going to bring it. He's going to bring the heat. He's a very good uh, was a very good amateur with a great pedigree as well, and he's looking to do the same as what Gongora did against Akhmadov, which is have that big breakout win. When we return, we'll hear from John David Jackson, the trainer for Majidov, the heavyweight who's only 3-0, and I believe, right now. But how good can this guy be? Well, he was an outstanding amateur. I mean, you saw him fight the likes of Anthony Joshua and all the top guys in the amateur um, setup. F guys from the Eastern Europe, European stage as amateurs tend to get very good funding to stay on. And he turned pro quite late in his career, but he's making great moves very quickly. He's a guy that will fight absolutely anyone. You know, his team and Zia and, and the management team, they just, you don't even have to ask them, will they fight these guys? And Fedosov's a guy, I think he's 31 and three or something. Mm -hmm. Like he's a guy that I know, I won't drop the minute, but I know other heavyweights that have actually turned him down, world ranked heavyweights. The good thing about Majidov is he doesn't say no to anyone. You know, he's talking about fighting AJ, fighting Dillian White, but this is going to be a good marker to see how good he is as a pro. He is older than, obviously, a, a, a traditional 3-0 prospect, but ready to go. He will fight anybody in the top 15. Let's see how he goes against a very tough challenge in Fedosov. Final question for you before we bring our guests in. I have to ask it. What's the latest on AJ versus Tyson? Well, we're in a good place. Um, you know, we know that three weeks ago we signed a contract for the fight. Then we had to present the fighters with options on the site deals. We did that last Sunday, uh, multiple offers. They both changed, chose the same one. Funnily enough, um, generally the that's, one with most great. money. Yeah, yeah. So we're in agreement at that. Now we're finalizing the venue and, and the, the paperwork with that site. And we're good to go. You know, I'm hoping that, I keep saying two weeks, two weeks. I'm hoping that, you know, next week we can move towards an announcement. The fight is going to take place in the summer. Um, two fights this year, the Undisputed Heavyweight World Championship, by far the biggest fight in boxing. I bumped into Tyson Fury in Vegas this week and he was on good form. And he just reiterated that it's the only fight. You know, both for both guys, let's be honest, like no other fight is going to satisfy the fans. These guys have an opportunity to create history in one of the biggest fights of all time. The sporting event of 2021, we're on the brink. You said you bumped into him. It wasn't an in and out burger or anything like that. Was it wasn't. He, he still good. fit? He looked he good. good. He had the Versace shirt on and the medallion and, you know, right, he's in good. his nice suite in Vegas. So he's ready to go. All right, when we return, we'll hear from John David Jackson. You're watching Beyond Before the Bell, before we head into tonight's main event. Andrade versus Williams. As promised, Todd Grisham, Eddie Hearn, and the trainer for Evander Holyfield, 
for Clarissa Shields and for Mohamed Razul Majvedov, who's fighting later Who? tonight. Mohamed Razul Majvedov. Yeah, good. Is that, that good? good? Yeah, it's is, good. Is that good? You should know. Yeah, yeah. What do he, you call him? Margo. Okay, Margo. Yeah, Mar Mar Margo's easier. Hey, I asked you this earlier, but for the crowd watching at home, everyone loved your long hair. Who convinced you to cut it off? The mirror, the mirror convinced me. I looked in the mirror one day and uh, I said, something's not right because the back felt real light and I put my hand there and there was a spot. So I figured, let me cut the rest off so match, my hair match up. <laughs> and what did people say when you showed up at the gym? Well, a lot of were shocked. You know, they, like you said, the, the ponytail and stuff. But hey, I said, it's time to go. I think it looks good. I, I bet it's a lot easier. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Way easier, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Well, you're here for Majidov. Tell us about uh, the progress he's made with you and what kind of expectations you have for him. Yeah. Well, you know, me and Margo, we've been together actually since 2011 when he's an amateur. They would come to America and I would train him. Um, I told him to turn pro in 2012, but his country is paying him a lot of money to stay amateur. So he stayed amateur, which isn't a problem. Um, you know, he's, he's on the fast track as far as I'm concerned because he lost a lot of time as an amateur and he's, he's older now. So for me, he didn't have a lot of time to really wait and wait around and have like 25 fights to, you know, get that confidence builder and, be, you know, know, know that when he gets in the ring for the title, he's there. That's not for him, really, because he'd be in five years, he'd be almost close to 40. Uh, not there, but close. So my thing is, he's a good fighter, strong puncher, listens and then does well, just needs to maybe step up his competition for himself. You know, I, I know Eddie has a plan for him, and, and that's, that's wonderful. But I tell him, for him, you got to start asking for these other fighters because you know, your time is limited, as all of our time, especially in boxing sports. Your time is limited, so you have to get on that fast track and maybe step it up a little bit and hopefully, you know, get the fights that you need to earn that title shot. Not just give him the title shot, but earn that title shot. This one's quite interesting, though, isn't it, against Fedosov? Like, Fedosov, although he's been inactive, as most people have through yeah. COVID, like, he was a guy that I know other heavyweights that turned him down previously, like, who wants him? Yes. Kind of guy, and and Margot's kind of in the same boat, isn't he? At three and zero, yes. what top ranked heavyweight is going to fight Margot unless it's for a load of money? Exactly. So, but this fight's going to, I think, tell us quite a lot about Margot and where he's at in that respect. That's the way I feel. I, you know, I watched him, and uh, he, he beat uh, another fighter of mine, Jim, Brian Jennings, had defeated him, but it wasn't, you know, a walkover. So, you know, I told Margot, this is the perfect fight for you because here's a, here's an opponent that's going to stand right in front of you. He's not running. He's going to stand right in front of you and see what you're made of. So it was up to him to, 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 you know, conquer the task at hand. I believe he can do it. It's, I think it's the perfect fight because it's going to answer a lot of questions for a lot of people about you, and, and you're one of them because you want to see what he's made of. And this is that fight that's going to do that for him. Have you thought about throwing Holyfield in there in a sparring session with him, see what he's made of? Not really. You know, <laughs> Marga can punch, you know, and oh, yeah. at this stage of, of Vander's career, he's just trying to make some money. Right. <laughs> He's not trying Stay to... away from those punches. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it, it would probably be a good thing if they sparred, but I wouldn't let that happen. What's your experience been like with Clarissa Shields? What kind of fighter is she? And is she indeed the greatest <laughs> woman of all time? Listen, um, Clarissa's a hell of a fighter. You know, she... And it, I try to say this not in a bad way, but she fights like a man. She fights. You know, most a lot of females, they flail away and they're kind of soft, but she fights. She comes to fight, and she has that male mentality to a degree. Um, wonderful, wonderful person. Talks a lot of trash, but that's okay because she backs it up. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to, you know, get the fan base built up for whatever fight that's in front of her. Uh, her and Savannah be a great fight because Savannah was the only person to defeat her as an amateur. So that, that right there, that alone sets Savannah apart from everybody else. But Clarissa, she's, she's a wonderful person. Talks a lot of trash, you know. Um, but in private, sweetheart. Wonderful person. How would you feel about the MMA move? Just like a bit of fun, or you, you don't really take it too seriously? Do you support well, it, or do you, um, what do you, what's your thoughts? I take it serious because if a, if, a, if a female gets in a chokehold, it's over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> so, you know, um, I told listen, when, when, when you do that, go out at the gate, throw those shots, throw those punches, because most your opponents aren't going to be used to that. Now, move your head, kind of, it's like a street fight. Um, and where she's from, Flint, she's had a lot of those. So <laughs> yeah, she, yeah. she's definitely up to the task. Uh, Personally, I, I'm not crazy about it, but it's her life, and she does what she wants to do. So I support her, and I, I you know, with the boxing part, I still help her with that. Personally, I wouldn't do it myself, but, you know, hey, she's who she is, and she wants to be famous, and hey, God bless her. Got to make that Savannah Marshall fight. I mean, that, for both girls, really, I think they're the, only, yeah. they're the only opponents that can really challenge them. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, Savannah's yeah. look great. She, oh, no, her journey is 
a lot earlier than yeah. Clarissa, but yeah. Clarissa's breezed for everyone. Like she's never really been, other than her pro debut actually, okay. she's never really <laughs> been in, in that. Like, yeah. She's taken on all comers, yes. but she's won easily. Yeah. I think Savannah and Clarissa need each other because they're really the yeah. two that are going to give each other great fights. I think that's the fight that, that the public deserves to see also because like you said, you know, there's only two out there that really can battle with one another. You know, uh, Savannah has the, the amateur win and that, you know, that that's plays on Clarissa's mind. She wants to avenge that. And, you know, and I think Savannah honestly believes in her heart that she's a better fighter. So I, th I think it makes for a great fight. Uh, I think the build-up's going to be great because these two are going to talk so much trash. It's unreal. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to be great, you know, when it happens. When a young fighter's looking for a trainer, what's kind of your resume? What do you say to these guys? Like, what kind of trainer are you compared to the other ones? If I, if I yeah. sign with you, mm -hmm. Mr. Jackson, yeah. what kind of fighter will, I, will you turn me into? Well, I... I I try to be more of a teacher because there's not that many teachers. There are a lot of good trainers in boxing, but there's very few teachers. And my, my, my teacher was Georgie Ben. And he taught me, and when I first met him, I could fight, but he made me a better fighter as a pro. And then as fighters go along, you know, even though you show me certain things, it's up to the fighter to become better because he has to watch other fighters and steal some of their moves. You know, you just don't learn from your, from your trainer. But I would, most guys that come to me to already know how to fight. I have to teach them from the day one how to jab and all that. So I just try to see what the good points are, and we, we work on those and take away the bad points. And, and keep the style that you have. I'm going to work off your style. I'm not going to change it for anything, because wh whatever's gotten you to this point is what works for you. And that's what I try to do. I try to say, I'm going to teach you offensively and defensively to make you better than what you are now. But what you, what you bring to the table, that's yours. And we're going to add to that. Who's the most talented fighter you've ever seen? That I've ever seen? You've ever worked with? Besides looking in the mirror, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have the hair anymore, so it's a little different. <laughs> there you go. Um, talented man. Or a guy that you've run him through the rings or, or her, and you go, my God, this, is, this person's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I'm going to put in categories for you. Defensively, Wolf Benitez, because he had that radar. He just he'd make you miss. You know, defensively, he was untouchable early in his career. Um, offensively, I'm going to go with the old school person, Sugar Ray Robinson. Offensively, he was he was the sugar man. He just he was number one pound for pound, the best fighter. Uh, if I put those two together, that's a tough one. But I'm, I'm, believe it or not, I'm going to go with Roberto Duran. Really? Duran, because he, he snatched your legs from his body shots. He, he, you know, he just fought some guys that were too big for him. They came along at the wrong time. Had they been lightweights, he'd have ran them all off the ring. You know, maybe with the exception of Sugar Ray Leonard, but even with that, as a lightweight, he probably would have ran Ray off the ring because Duran was vicious, man. His body attack was just unbelievable. Most people don't really, when they watch him today, they still don't just look at the man. Think about it, he fought David Moore and, 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 and Iran Barkley. They were bigger than he was. He broke them both down nice. And they were younger, stronger. And he stayed in the pocket and broke them both down real nice. Maybe they didn't have the experience he had, but they were, you know, the favorites and they, they were supposed to beat this old man up. Hey, he, he's promoting this big fight coming up this summer, hopefully. Mm -hmm. AJ versus Fury. Who do you like in that fight? Steady. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> you can say whatever you want. Yeah. Don't worry, don't. Can, I, can, I, can I get a job about this? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, this, that's an intriguing fight. Fury's, you know, believe it or not, I don't, I'm not crazy about his style, but boxing-wise, he, he's, he's the best out there. I think punching, I, I think Anthony has that edge. So it's, you know, it depends on what, if Anthony can be loose and, and, you know, not tight during the fight, he has a great shot because no one's gone to uh, Fury's body the way they should. You know, he gets on the ropes and does all that movement. Fool, go to his body, forget his head. I think Anthony would do that because Anthony can punch. And if he's tired, how to go to the body and stay relaxed. It makes for an intriguing fight. I, I, you know, I, right now it's a pick him. You got you to just really study both and see who's going to come out victorious. Uh, mindset, well, I wouldn't say mindset. Fury talks a lot. And that's what, you know, if you believe in yourself, you're supposed to. Uh, I think Anthony's more of a, more of a, Josh is more of a gentleman. He's not going to talk crazy, but I, I think, like Eddie Hearn. I think he have a plan. I, th I think he'll have a, come fight and have a plan. And, you know, I, th I, th I think if there's one person that could, could beat Fury, you know, real stylistically and in, in a good manner, I think it would be um, Joshua. He has to be on, on, on fight night when this fight does happen. He has to be on top of his game. You know, whatever, Fury does and tries to offset him, he has to be able to capitalize on that because Fury makes a lot of mistakes. He's got to be smart and make him cap capitalize off the mistakes that he makes because he's beatable. But if you just sit there and do what he wants to do, you're going to get lost. 
and three, four, five rounds go by, go by. Now you're behind the eight ball. What are you going to do? Now you might get desperate and just have to throw anything at him, and, and then, he, then he has you. But, you know, if Anthony has a good plan and he, and he goes out there and he does what he's supposed to do, don't be in a hurry to try to knock this guy out, I think he can get him. You know, I'm not saying he's going to win. I'm saying it's, it's, it's a pick it's a pick em fight right now. And whomever, I guess, listen to where the corner devises for them, if it's workable, then, you know, then, then he, he definitely, I'd give him a great shot to win that fight. Honestly, I've the hairs on my arms standing up, <laughs> even talking about the fight, you know what I mean? Because yeah. I know when it comes down to it, it's so much on the line and there's nothing like being involved in a fight where you want to win so bad, you know? And, and once we cut up this show, I'm going to be playing that back to Anthony and just, just letting him understand what he's got to do. He's right, he's got a plan and well, it's going to be a great fight. Well, good luck and finally before we let you go, what's the game plan tonight? Majidov, what, what can we expect to see from your fighter? Well, to me, um, he's got the, a good opponent in front, of, in front of him because his opponent doesn't go anywhere but right in front. He doesn't slip. He doesn't slide. He doesn't bob and weave. He's right in front of you. Uh, for Maga, that, that, that's right down his alley because now he can use all, all of his power and take his time and go to the body and break this guy down and make it a good fight uh, for a while. Um, I, I think the body shots would be the tail, the telltale of what happened in this fight. I just think that his opponent hasn't been hit like that consistently. And Maga can punch. So he has to be smart, take his time, use that good jab, go to the body and break his opponent down. And it, it, it should be an easy win for him. And I'm not saying it's going to be. But if he does what he's supposed to do, it's, 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 it's an easy night for him. If not, then he, listen, he, got a, he has a nice, long, hard fight that he can just sit back and say, I'm a great matchmaker. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thanks for stopping by and good luck to you, John. My, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. All right. When we return, we'll hear from the Chechen wolf himself, Arthur Biarslanov, when we return to Before the Bell. Yeah, now you won't see the edge. Like, I, I literally got like my razor. Up. You have to. I got, I got the puzzle up. My you didn't have to sharpen up the picture for my hand, you know. Otherwise, you know the hair blocks it. Yeah, that's my. You know, each fight, I want to fight better guys. I want to fight uh, top rated guys, you know. And uh, I want to move as quickly as I can, you know, because I'm ready. I feel good. I'm at the age now. I'm almost 26, uh, so uh, I feel really good and I feel very confident. Hello and welcome back to Before the Bells. We get you set for tonight's big card featuring Liam Williams challenging Demetrius Andre for his version of the middleweight championship of the world. And joining us now, an undefeated rising star on the matchroom stable. He is from Chechnya, which is why he's called the Chechen Wolf, I would assume. Arthur Bjarslanov, welcome, my friend. How are you feeling as you get set to step in the ring tonight? I feel great now that the weigh are done, rehydrated, uh, I'm ready to go for tomorrow. Your opponent, 9-0 and with seven knockouts. He's never lost. You've never been beaten. What kind of fight do you think this is going to be? I hope it to be a good fight. I mean, long-lasting because uh, my previous fight's been finishing so fast. I had four fights that finished the first round. So, you shouldn't punch so hard, should you? Uh, <laughs> this is a problem. That, I mean, I try to uh, stay composed now, but, you know, I guess I have heavy hands. When I hit you, it, it hurts. So we'll see how it goes. You know, I know he's a good boxer. He has good amateur background, so he should be able to dodge some of the punches. But uh, I know that once I get him, uh, it'll, it'll be good. So would you prefer this fight if you had a choice to be a close, competitive fight that goes the distance, or would you rather blow him out of there in the first rank, round? Of course, we all want knockout. You know, knockout is it's nice. It makes it look amazing. You know, eight rounds, you know, some pe people love knockouts, and, uh, and that's what I hope to have tomorrow. Every fighter has a great story, a great background. I shouldn't say great, but an interesting story, sometimes a challenging story. But your childhood and your journey to where you are today may take the cake. If you could, just kind of run us through the Cliff Notes version of where you started and how you got to where you are. Uh, it was very tough. I was born during the, 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 the first Cold War that started in 1995, which is why I was born in Mahachkala, Dagestan. Uh, we had to move from Chechnya. Uh, second Cold War started in 1999. And that's the time we got caught in the crossfire. We're trying to leave the country, and they weren't letting they weren't letting anyone leave. And uh, we eventually got to Baku, Azerbaijan. It's where I lived for six years. Uh, my father my father passed away when I was seven, so it was very tough for my mom to raise four kids. Uh, and uh, she, you know, she's a strong woman, and uh, she raised us all four of us. Uh, we moved to Canada. I was ten years old when we moved here, uh, 2010. And I was a big soccer player. I never thought I'd be a boxer, to be honest. But my brother was the fighter in the family. He would always did uh, he did karate, boxing, any sport you name it. He was always fighting, you know. And uh, he kind of like forced me into boxing when I was uh, 12 years old. 
And ever since then, I was just, you know, I just loved winning. And that's what kept me going. And then I gave up my favorite sport, uh, soccer, for boxing. And I, I don't regret the day. So. Tell them about the Chechen Wolf, Nick. Then, uh, come on, that's the, oh, that's the, the, the key Chechen, to the story. The Chechen Wolf story, I, I said a couple of times before, but uh, it was in 1999 when we were caught in the crossfire. Uh, we were trying to uh, leave the, the country, but they weren't letting anyone leave. And uh, it was, I remember, I don't remember everything, but I remember like the bombs, the shootings and the noises, the people running around, you know, and going crazy. And uh, it was it was a very rough time. Uh, I was four years old and uh, the crossfire started and everyone started running around kind of. So I, I, got, I, I guess we got lost in the middle of like people running around. And uh, we had uh, our soldiers there too that uh, uh, came and saved us. Uh, I think that if, if they weren't there, maybe who knows what would have happened. Uh, they were carrying me, running with me, and uh, asking me, like, what's your name? Whose son are you? And me, I'm a little kid, four years old, you know, crying and saying, I'm Chechen Wolf, I'm Chechen Wolf. And that's what I was answering. That's what I remember. And uh, they said, hey, we can't let the Chechen Wolf die, you know. And uh, my father, when I was younger, he used to always tell me, like, be like a Chechen Wolf, you know, be a wolf. Because back in the days... Uh, our traditional like animal in our country is like a wolf. You know, wolf is a strong symbol. You strong like a wolf, and that's where we got the nickname from Chechen Wolf. Incredible. So, what does your family and friends from that region of the world think about you now? Do you stay in touch? Definitely. I was there actually last uh, just a year ago. I was I went back to visit Chechnya. Uh, it's beautiful now, very nice now, very peaceful. You know, and everyone was happy to see me. All my cousins, my relatives. It was just very beautiful. I hope to go more often now. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm very excited though. You said you lived in Dagestan for a while. What is it about that country or that part of, I guess, is former Soviet Union that produces so many great MMA fighters, so many great uh, boxers? It's really incredible. You know, that, that, that part of the region, the mountain, is called the Caucasian, uh, Caucasus uh, Mountains area. It's called Kafkaz, uh, Dagestan. You know, you got Chechnya, Ingushetia, Ossetia, all these little countries that are still part of the Ru Russia. Uh, they're all fighters. They love wrestling, uh, boxing, uh, any uh, combat sambo, any fighting sport, you name it. Anyone there knows how to fight. And uh, it's just a tradition. They've been fighting their whole life. Uh, and uh, that's what keeps dumb us mentally strong and uh and that's why here i am at this stage because i've been working hard and i'm mentally strong and what's your ultimate goal your dream fight when does the chechen wolf say i've done it i want to be a world champion i want to be undisputed world champion i want to collect all the belts i want to beat everyone and stay undefeated for many years I have, I, have, I have big dreams. I don't want to just win fights. I want to fight the best. I want to fight undefeated guys. I feel that I'm ready now. Next week, I'm going to be 26. Uh, and now I feel like it's, it's time for me to shine one fight at a time. And hopefully in the future, if everything goes well tomorrow, uh, hopefully we'll make better fights, Eddie. What did Matchroom see in this guy that you, you wanted him on your roster? Well, I love the story. I mean, Keith Connolly um, told me, about um, Arthur, and we had a meeting. I think it was in New York, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Yeah, it was New about York. two years ago. Um, he brought his book with him, and you know, talked about the story, and, and told me just what he said then. And I was just, you know, taken in by the story. You know, what you get in when you work with a fighter from that region. You know, you you said earlier, you, these guys are tough. I mean, they're not talking about growing up in, you know, just a, a rough neighbourhood. You're talking about guys that are growing up like like he said in the Cold War under crossfire. So you know that they're, they're bred tough, and that's part of the game, part of the sport of boxing. He also had an exceptional amateur career as well. Um, Pan-Asian Games, um, won a huge amount of, of tournaments as an amateur as well. So I knew he had the pedigree. I think that the growth of boxers from that region, and particularly starting with Gennady Golovkin, has kind of paved the way for Eastern European fighters. Obviously, Betabiev. You know, these kind of guys, even Bivol from Russia. You know, you're seeing a lot of guys now become major names in the United States. He also has a big following in Canada as well, of course, where, where he resides. So he can really fight. And, and the exciting thing now is moving towards these kind of fights because you're fighting guys that are coming to win. You're fighting guys that are looking to take their opportunity to get signed or get a TV deal. He's already got it. And I think you're going to see fighters with great pedigree and great ability shine against better opposition. You know, he's had the easy fights, and he never wanted an easy fight, but it's just something you get given when you start out. You're 2-0, 3-0, you're fighting guys on late notice and, you know, who aren't on your level. This 
is the kind of test that he needs to say, okay, if we breeze through this, then we're looking at moving towards top 15 in the world, guys. And he's not afraid to take those chances. So 26, basically approaching his prime now. Let's see how he gets the victory tonight. I'm sure he will. And then move on to, to bigger and better tests. But he can really fight and he can really punch. And he's excited. And I think tonight you've got two punchers going in there. And this guy can, can punch as well. He's got to be on his game. But come through this in flying colours and, and then really start stepping up into the 10 rounds and, and the championship fights. All right, finally, how many languages do you speak, by the way? Uh, I speak four languages. So English, Russian? Chechen and Azerbaijan. What's your favorite? I can't. I mean, I don't have a favorite. I love them all because I know I know four <laughs> you're languages. You're the ultimate fence rider. He's the new teach Switzerland. That's what this guy's become. He doesn't like war anymore. But you're going to bring us war tonight. I know that in the ring. Congratulations on your success and good luck tonight. Thank you. All right. When we return, we'll hear from one of the most respected voices in boxing today in the United States media. Is that? Oh, that hurt you. Is that, is that true with Chris Mannix? Either way, that's who's coming up next. Chris Mannix, the face of the zone, and a great. Uh, writer for Sports Illustrated, when we return to Before the Bell. I'm going to be the new kid on the block, and I'm going to be hot. I'm going to be some hot shit, do you know what I mean? Uh, I think I'm going to knock on Rod Eye up. They all say that. That's everybody's favorite thing to say. And it never happens. At the end of the day, this Liam Williams kid is not going to stop this train. Look at me when they say they're going to knock me out. <laughs> what you mean, bro? Welcome back to Before the Bell as we count down the minutes to tonight's WBO middleweight championship between Liam Williams and Demetrius Andrade. And joining us now, of course, is Chris Mannix from Sports Illustrated as well as DAZN. I've read all the comments from Twitter. Everyone wants to know. How did you guys form what is considered to be probably the biggest media promoter bromance in boxing history? I'm not sure about that. He's, you know, we, we did fall out, I think it was around the Ryan Garcia fight, you know, but this week we're very pally because he is officially Demetrius Andrade's number one fan. This is I'm e closely following. He calls me like, he called me yesterday. He's like, <laughs> Eddie, there's not enough people writing about Demetrius. I'm going to write about him. When are we going to get these big fights? When are we going to do this? So, yeah. This week, we're, we're, we're well aligned. It, it ebbs and flows because, like, when Ryan Garcia is around, I gravitate towards Ryan, and I start building him up. But then Demetrius Andrade is up, so I immediately – like, Eddie was getting off a plane from – you know, across the world, and I'm still texting. I'm like, I know you're sleeping. Wake up, wake up. You got to talk to me. Demetrius. You got to talk to me. I need to talk to Demetrius. Well, he's been screaming from the loudest mountaintop about uh, Ryan Garcia fighting Devin Haney. Why do you think that Ryan Garcia chose another option right now? It, I, I don't know. I can't speak for Ryan Garcia. I don't think that Devin Haney excites him all that much right now. And look, you can go back to February of 2019 when Ryan knocked out. Uh, his opponent, and then Devin climbed into the ring. And when he said, I made a list of all the guys he wanted to fight, he said Luke Campbell. He said Gervonta Davis. He mentioned Haney, but he mentioned him last. So I, I just think, I, I think for Devin Haney, and we don't have to get too deep in the weeds on this, this Linares fight is everything. Like, he has to look good against Hoy Linares. If he does, I think that Ryan Garcia will get interested in a Devin Haney fight before the end of the year. If it's a 12-round decision, I'm not so sure. Yeah, but he has to look good. But, I mean, even a victory against Linares, I mean, you were saying earlier on, off camera, that's a real fight. I mean, Linares yeah. can really fight. I think with Haney, you know, we talk about it could be the next Floyd, he could be this. But when you look at his resume and you really break it down, I mean, Gamboa was a good win, but he's well past his best. Linares, although in the latter stages of his career, you watch his Instagram, you see him training. I mean, this is a guy that is really motivated. I like last chance saloon. But we're never going to agree on that one. But, but let, me, let me ask you this then. Like, we're here for a Demetrius Andrade fight, and you and I talked this week, and one of the things you said was like, you know, Andrade, you go back to the Selecki fight. Like, he needed to do something big in that fight. He didn't do it. Are you starting to feel the same way about Devin Haney, that he needs to do something big? Well, I think he's had less opportunities to mm -hmm. do so. I mean, you know, the spectacular knockout of Moran. Um, he labored to a win on the KSI card. When he was hurt. When he, he hurt was hurt, shoulder. yeah. Yeah, so... Gambo, again, impressive. Like, he's crafty, Gambo, you know, but I do feel you're right. This is the big opportunity. This is the breakout fight against Jorge Linares that he needs and that he's wanted for a long, long time. Um, I just feel that 
you know, when, when it comes down to it, a lot of these fights don't happen because they don't fancy the fight. You know, you can't say Luke Campbell excites me, but Devin Haney doesn't. And we're in the same boat here with Charlo and Andre. Like, you can't say, I want to unify the division. I want to face the champions. And then you've got the opportunity to do it. And you say, well, I don't want to fight Demetrius because he doesn't excite me. No, you know how good he is. You know how hard he is to beat. And that's similar with Haney. But that's why when you go back to the... I mean, I, I, I always talk about the Seletsky fight for Andre, mm. where if he would have got him out of there in the first, second, or third round, you, you were there. The place was going nuts, right? It was. That, it was an impressive was crowd. Yeah. It was an impressive was. crowd for. I didn't think he was going to be able to get seven, eight, nine, ten thousand, whatever the final number was in that building. And I remember sitting there ringside, and I hear Demetrius' father in between the first and the second round say, "Slow down. That's not how we fight." I'm like pulling my hair out. I'm like, "No, no, that's exactly how you fight. This guy is ripe to get knocked out." And he wasn't, and I think that cost him something. I think this will be different mm -hmm. because a lot of people go in their shell. Williams will not go in his shell, 100%. He would rather get knocked clean out. He will not stop trying to walk Demetrius down. He will not stop trying to beat him up. And I think this potentially, hopefully, could be his breakout fight where Demetrius looks spectacular. And then we can truly get on the mic and say, Charlo, <laughs> your brother's doing it. Why can't you do it? But in a laboring performance, it always gives someone just a little excuse mm -hmm. to go, oh, you're not exciting. You're not putting the performances together. Which, I, th which I think Canelo did back in 2019. I think Canelo, Eddie Reynoso, I think they did. When, when he, and I don't want to call it labored through the Seletsky fight, but when he went 12 rounds, I think the team Canelo took notice of that. We're like, you know what? This doesn't really do it for me. So... They say the pin is mightier than the sword. You've got a big pin. You've got a big voice. You've been screaming for Andre versus Charlo. Fans are screaming for Terrence Crawford versus Errol Spence Jr. All these fights just never seem to get made. Even Floyd versus uh, Manny took eight, nine years too long. Back in the 80s, there's a Four Kings documentary coming out. These guys relished the opportunity. They didn't want to be called yellow and coward and scared. What's changed in the boxing or the boxer's mind over the past 15 to 20 years where you can't even shame these guys into taking fights? Well, two, two things, and Eddie can speak to this a lot better than I can, but I would say, one, there were definitely issues making fights in the 80s for sure. I mean, Marvin Hagler, the late Marvin Hagler, could attest to that. I mean, that amount of years he spent chasing Sugar Ray Leonard around until that fight actually happened uh, spoke for itself. But I think that the Floyd Mayweatherification of boxing has changed it. I think there is an obsession with a perfect record now. And I think that anything that resembles a risk is just not something that guys are running towards at this point. And look, Demetrius Andrade represents arguably the biggest risk in the middle rate division. Like, he is incredibly skilled. He is powerful, as we've seen in fights with Walter Kautendakwa and Zaletsky and Luke Keeler. Uh, I just don't think guys are running towards him. I think everything is – is. I don't think that you can paint don't, everything don't in one brush. I think that a lot of that reputation is from the old days. Like, Charlo and these guys, Danny Jacobs even, like, I think they grew up with Demetrius in the amateurs, and he was just so good. Like, what performance? Cowton Dockwa, Suleski, Akovov, Kila, have you really looked at and gone, oh, well, Golovkin can't beat him, Charlo can't beat him. I just feel that it's like his previous reputation. And based on those performances, he might not beat Williams. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yep. there is an argument to say when you really break it down, go, okay, he won every round, but did he really show you that he's a great puncher? Does he really show you that, you know, he's he's the best middleweight on the planet? No, and I, I don't think he's invincible by any stretch. When I talk to managers and promoters of other middleweights, you know, whenever I bring up Andrew, like, oh, southpaw, slick, you're going to look bad against him. Like, I hear that same refrain over and over again. But this is, this is honestly... The Android situation, one of the most maddening in boxing. Usually you can explain why fights don't happen. A guy doesn't have a title. A guy doesn't have money behind him. Android's got both. Like, he has a recognized world championship. He has real money behind him in trying to make fights. I mean, we can go back down this path, but the offers to Jamal Charlo were multi-million dollar offers, huge offers to face Demetrius Andre in a fight that if he won – he would take an enormous step forward and give himself a mandate to face Canelo or Gennady Golovkin. What's, that what, to me. What's his argument uh, not taking the fight? Besides, it could be a tricky fight. It's it's nonsensical. There, there honestly is. Like I've listened to interviews that he's given. I did one with him. Isn't it just the training? Go. You don't want to fight Demetrius. I think that's. No, it's not. They but, don't think they can win, but. That, oh, that's a that's a fight you don't want to be involved with. That like, that could certainly uh, that could certainly it, be the case. But, but the arguments, Eddie, are, are just. I mean, I did an interview with Charlo before his fight with Derevinchenko, and he quite literally hung up the phone on me when I kept asking about Andre and kept asking me because the answers 
don't make any sense. He did an interview on a podcast recently where he kept pivoting from Benavidez to Andrade, why he won't fight these guys, and none of it made any sense. I can't explain it. I don't understand. There's real money. There's a world title. This should be a fight, Demetrius Andrade, that Jamal Charlo is running towards. Instead, he's fighting a guy in Juan Montiel, which I think is one of the worst headliners in the history of boxing. It is a terrible headlining fight. Showtime's got a great slate. That's not a knock on what they're doing. But that fight, I, I wrote this early in the week. I mean, Montiel could bring a, a chair to the ring with him, and he would still be an underdog against Jamal Charlo. I, I don't understand the thinking in taking a fight like this when Andrade is out there ready, willing, and able to fight. And his brother's facing the champion. I mean, cut Castano, great fight. Great fight. You know, tough fight. Meaningful. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean that. Uh, I just don't get it. It's been, honestly, at 160, uh, Jamal had an excellent resume, solid resume at 154. His last fight there, J-Rock Williams, terrific win. Since then, I believe that was 2016, he has not had a meaningful fight. Nothing at the middleweight division. And you're just wasting prime years. I'm not sitting here saying Andrew's going to win. I have no idea. Oh, I, think he's the, I think he's probably the underdog. <laughs> probably. Jamal is an excellent fighter. But the fact that he won't take this fight is one of the most maddening things I've covered since Pacquiao versus Mayweather. Speaking of maddening, and I know we've got the, the head of matchroom here, but have you heard anything about Deontay Wilder? What's going on with that guy? What, his... His income so he's ratio. Try, he's still probably trying to get some dollars out of Tyson Fury. Is, it, is, is he still it's doing the, yeah. the, the fake glove? There's, I mean, why isn't he fighting? There's no resolution to the the arbitration as of yet. The expectation is he's not going to win, but there may be a financial settlement uh, on the back end there. I've heard Fox and Charles Martin at some point before the end of the year. I think that is probably Deontay's next fight on pay-per-view. He'll lose that fight. You think he'll lose that fight? I think he's lost the plot. I think the inactivity. That hurts. Is, I mean, we're talking about what we're now. We're coming up to May. He's not going to fight till September, October. It's going to be a year and a half. He will have no confidence whatsoever. I just think he, he was losing almost every round to Ortiz before that fight. Yeah, I mean, but, that was not But then, but then the, the question is: he, Was he actually ever any good? You know, yeah, he was. I mean, he can punch, but he was consistently losing rounds to to you know fighters, and then who knows? But I just want to see him fight. Yeah. I'm great. I'm really excited to see Andy Ruiz back, not against Ariola, but I'd love to see Wilder against Andy Ruiz. You know, I, I'm, I said that to Canelo when I saw him this week, and he was like, "Oh yeah," like he thinks Andy Ruiz will beat every heavyweight out there right now. Do you think Andy Ruiz That's, is gaining something from Team Team Canelo? Oh, amazing. I mean, I went to the gym. Have you been to the gym? Then? No, uh, not the one in San Diego. Okay, amazing. Like, I walked in and I was like, "Is that?" It? <laughs> you know, you think, "Wow, this small space, like literally from here." To there, you know, mm -hmm. Breeds, Canelo Alvarez, Ryan Garcia, Andy Ruiz, you know, Oscar, I believe, trained, Valdez, trained yeah. in there, Oscar Valdez, you know, and I think it's literally the guys are sparring and someone's on a running machine that is two feet away and you're watching pound for pound greats in there sparring. But one thing with Canelo and Eddie Reynoso is they don't want anyone in the gym that's not giving it 120%. Mm -hmm. And I think Andy's, it's hard to not enjoy that spirit in the gym. And it seems like Andy's embraced that. He's a great fighter. You know what I mean? I, th I, think, I, think, I think Andy Ruiz would give Deontay Wilder the most horrific fits in a fight. Well, you can't, I, he's, you can't knock him out. Like no. He's got a granite chin. So if you can't knock him out, you've got to try to outbox him. And that's not been Deontay's strength. He, he will find a way inside and he will put him to sleep. Very quickly. I saw a picture of Andy Ruiz Jr. His legs look shredded. He's lost all this weight. But there's a golfer named David Duvall. You, I don't know if you're a big yeah, yeah. golfer. He, he was winning majors, great golfer. He decided to get in great shape. He used to be kind of fat. He got completely shredded, amazing shape, basically never won again. Andy Ruiz has always been a chubby, fat kid. He knows his body. He knows how to win that way. If he gets super fit and becomes basically a different person, doesn't he become a different boxer and could be a worse boxer, would you say, Chris? I don't know. I mean, the hand speed has always been Andy's greatest strength. Accuracy. I mean, I, I got to believe that conditioning is only going to help him. I don't think it's going to take away his fastball, so to speak. I think he's going to be the same fighter, but one that can be as strong in 9 through 12 as he is 1 through 6. He's, I remember when I, even when he was heavy in Saudi and we did the, the workout, right? I just remember everyone was around the ring just going, like, he was so fast. Mm -hmm. Even when he was, like, what did he weigh in for that? 19 and a half stone or something like that. His hand speed was so fast and people were just looking at him going, I don't think AJ's got any chance. You know, and and being lighter, he should be faster. 
But I think he's such an exciting... Uh, I mean, I love Dillian White against Andy Ruiz. I love Andy Ruiz against Dillian, uh, Deontay Wilder. I love Andy Ruiz against Luis Ortiz. I, I love Andy Ruiz against anyone, to be honest with you. <laughs> so just all, not those, Chris all those fights you just mentioned will never happen, but no, anyway... No, I think Andy will, but I mean... Wonder if you've got... I mean, Ruiz against Ariola is like... I mean, it's, it's, it's a fair comeback fight. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But how that is landed on pay-per-view... But it just shows you Andy Ruiz got paid a lot of money and he ain't fighting for a million bucks anymore. So Heyman and those guys are going, well, the only choice we've got is to stick it on pay-per-view. And, and as Canelo and Reynoso told me, outside of Canelo, he's number two in Mexico in terms of popularity. I mean, you know, he was the heavyweight world champion. So, and he's fun to watch. Chris, of all the fights that have been announced, Showtime's got their scheduled his own matchroom, Golden Boy, uh, top rank. Of all the, the fights that have been made and named, which one excites you the most? We're assuming that Joshua Fear is not on that list yet. We're not, not, not yeah, because be <laughs> yeah, that will be that would be number one uh, in a heartbeat. Two jump to mind: Canelo against Billy Joe Saunders. I think is going to be an excellent fight, and Billy Joe is going to be really difficult to figure out. Probably the best boxer that Canelo has faced since prime Arislandi Lara back in 2014. I talked to Canelo about that last week, and and he saw the comparisons there, and he understands the difficulty of the challenge that is going to be Billy Joe Saunders. And the other is the one we just talked about, Jermel Charlo against Brian Castaño. We were part of the broadcast of Castaño when he took the title off Patrick Teixeira. He is just constant pressure. Now, that may mean you walk into something, and Jermel is one of the bigger punchers at 154, but I think that is going to be an explosive fight for as long as it lasts. Which one are you most excited about? I like, I like the charlo Castano fight. I, I'm really excited about Haney Linares because I think We've, we've wanted that for so long, you know, that opportunity yeah. to, to shine. Um, you know, and I think that, I, I actually think that Ryan Garcia um, against Fortuna is a really good fight as well. I don't think that's that's a cast iron. Harper versus Taylor? Yeah. Uh, well, Harper versus Choi oh, will I'm be sorry. first. You're talking about t Taylor Ch Jonas. Yeah, yeah, Taylor Jonas. Great fight. Chisora Parker. You know, Dimitri Bivol on that card. That's May the 1st. Um, coming up and, you know, hopefully we see Chocolatito against Estrada 3 on the back end of the summer. Lots of exciting stuff planned and coming up. But, you know, of course, the big one, AJ Fury, hopefully next week we can give you some news and that will trump everything. But I must say, right now, of everything that's planned for me, Canelo against Billy Joe Saunders is the fight of 2021. I've been with both guys this week. Canelo is so confident. So confident. Will the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders be in the arena? If, if they hear you're there, Todd, I think 100%. <laughs> you, know, you know what's interesting about Canelo? I asked him this, and we see what's happening at light heavyweight right now, right? They're going for an undisputed champion. You know, Bevel, of course, coming back on the card May 1st. Uh, he has got a piece of that title. Joe Smith better be we assume, is going to happen in New York before the end of the year. I thought Canelo would be more interested in moving up again to fight the undisputed champion. He didn't, when we were talking about it, he didn't seem... I just think he knows that it's, he just can't, like, 175. But if it's Bevel... Yeah, but I think if it's better... I mean, I, I, I don't think he'd rule that out. I think right now what he's saying to himself is, I want to be undisputed at 168, right? The run would be incredible, incredible wouldn't it? Take Yildirim away, and it would be Jacobs, Kovalev, Smith... Saunders plant. I mean, that's an incredible run. And when you go to his gym and you look at all his fight posters, you start to start to realize, you know, Mayweather, Cotto, Khan, mm -hmm. you know, Smith, Saunders, you know, loads, loads of other fights as well, even like Kirkland. I know that, that some of them were faded, but still like good resume. And after he's become undisputed at 168, I don't, I don't really know what the challenge is. He'll always want to challenge himself. I think he'd like to box internationally as well. Um, but I do also think when he boxed Kovalev, he kind of realized... I'm really mm -hmm. not a 175 pounder, mm -hmm. you know, but um, he's probably not even a 168 pounder, really. No, I mean, really, like, like he was, what did he fight Floyd at? 149? Something 52, like that. Well, he was 52. Because remember, he had to squeeze himself down a little bit yeah. for that. But really, Floyd he's a middle. I mean, he's yeah. a big middleweight, yeah. like, I think, and he's a small, super middleweight. So I think sometimes you see these guys who end up getting beat in fights they shouldn't really be in mm -hmm. because they've had no choice but to move through the weights. And, you know, even when you look at Lomachenko, really, he's a, he's a feather, he's a big featherweight. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a super featherweight. And, you know, he's, he had to move up to lightweight for the challenges, and he come up against a very big lightweight in Teofimo Lopez and got beat. Mm. And I don't, I think Canelo would probably kick himself if he did that. But listen, Saunders is in tremendous shape. You know, he's kept a low profile in this camp. I saw him in his training camp in Las Vegas. He's bang on weight. He fancies it. You know, Tyson Fury. He always gets up for bigger he, fights. Yeah, well, he goes down this, for the this lesser This is where you up. see the best. Yeah. And, and I'm hoping that's the same with Demetrius Andre mm -hmm. tonight. Your prediction, what happens tonight when the bell rings? Andre Williams. Please, God, let it be an inside three-round knockout. Like, I mean, just 
Williams for a three-round knockout. No, I think oh, I'm, oh, I'm oh, looking okay. – look, I, I agree with Eddie that Williams is going to keep coming forward. I think Williams has improved significantly since he started working with Dominic Engel. He's not the same fighter that he was when he lost those two times to Liam Smith. His conditioning is better. He's talked about it. His health habits have been better. I think he's a better fighter than what people will point to on his box wreck. That being said, if he comes forward, he's going to present opportunities for Andrade, who is an accurate puncher and has a big left hand to score. And I'm hoping that Andrade seizes those opportunities. If it goes 12 rounds and it goes and we see, get another lopsided decision, it might be an uncomfortable post-fight interview because I'm not so it sure. Will be, but the, the, good, the good news is, is if it goes 12 rounds, it will be hard work for Demetrius. And if it's hard work and he doesn't win great, maybe those guys will go, actually, I'll fight him. Maybe. No. Yeah, I guess it would have to be a struggle for, for them. But if it's the same thing as Soletsky, I don't know how that moves him up the ranks. I mean, I asked you this on the phone. Like, how, what's the fight for him? Like, what is that big fight? Like, Golovkin, and I was... It's right, only really Golovkin or Charlo. But Golovkin, but you and you know think, this, Golovkin and Murad are yeah. kind of circling each other yeah. for, for New Year's Eve at the end yeah. of the year. Like, that's probably going to happen. Uh, it's a fight that Golovkin's really interested in. And, and, you know, Mr. Honda over in Japan as well. Unless it's unless you can get Charlo, I don't know what the fight is no, for Demetrius. I, I just don't know what it is. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. All right, before we let you go, I'd love to get your take on the, the current celebrity slash old-timers league that's coming up. Evander Holyfield's coming back. Oscar <laughs> De La Hoya. Not so much the YouTubers, but the old legend boxers that are coming back. Is that good for the sport or bad for the sport? I don't know that it's good or bad one way or the other. I think that anyone putting on fights featuring legends – may be sorely disappointed in the returns when they're not Mike Tyson. I mean, I think Tyson is a is a shooting star. Like, Tyson is someone that uh, older fans get invested in and younger fans still want to see despite his age. Curiosity. It's the it? curiosity. I don't think there's the same curiosity in a Vander Holyfield. I don't think there's the same curiosity in Oscar De La Hoya versus MMA Fighter X. I think that you saw Tyson Jones do a massive number. And I think that got a lot of people interested in retired fighters getting back, thinking they can do the same numbers. I don't think that's going to happen. I, I think there'll be a real crash back to earth with these retired fighters who are not named Mike Tyson. Your thoughts? Um, as I said to you earlier, like, I don't mind like Jake Paul against Askren. Like, it is what it is. It's like kind of like... MMA boxing, two, well, one fighter. And Jerry Springer show. You watch yeah, it? Yeah, but at least it's like they're both training to fight. I hate the old timer stuff. They're just basically doing it because they need a, a few dollars. And I don't blame them. You know, some, I think Evander's getting 10 million or something like that. That's the rumor. To, listen to it, these guys speak and watch them walk around. They should not be fighting in a ring. Evander Holyfield had some of the most brutal wars I've ever seen against the likes of Riddick Bow and Tyson. And, and he does not want to be back in there taking more punishment to the head. People, it's actually quite disgusting. It's different when it's Oscar De La Hoya because he never really took a lot of punishment and he's Not kind of still level, fresh. Yeah. But like anyone around boxing who would talk to these guys and realize that these are older men who are battle-worn. Like there is no one in boxing, regardless of what you think about me or Aram or, or you know, I can't say Oscar because he's doing it. But, but you know, <laughs> like, you, yeah. you know, like, some people are very stubborn. Some people um, might not even be pleasant people. But people in boxing care about boxing. Mm. And they are quite emotional towards fighters because you, you can't help but fall in love with fighters, right? No one would let Evander Holyfield go in the ring. No one from boxing would let Holyfield go in the ring to fight again. Which fighter do you have the closest relationship over all the years? Which, what's the guy that you just... Well, the one who's boxing at the moment is Anthony Joshua, but probably beyond that, who's retired is probably Tony Bellew. You know, a guy who oh. you know we. What did, we what, did, what did that feel like when Usyk knocked him to the rope? Well, right, the, right not in the front best, of you. Todd. I thought you were going to say, "What did it feel like when he won the <laughs> WBC <laughs> no, 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 World Cup?" Hey, yeah. No, 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 no. What's it like? That. All the positives. There, there's, there's actually a horrible picture where he. Got I know. I saw it was there. I, I, yeah. I tried to help him. You know, that was a. I say that fight was my fault. Like he. He was winning that fight. Yeah, just about. I mean, but it was it, Usyk was tiring him, and he it's was clever, and yeah, direction. yeah, and it was like he won the world title at Everton, which is his his home football club, right? Premier League club. He won the WBC world title. He defended it. He beat David Hay twice, and then he was like, he made so much money that he'd never ever dreamed of. And then the Usyk fight came up, and the money was great, but it was like, and we were both in two minds. But it was like Tony, if you beat this guy. 
you are the undisputed cruiserweight champion of the world. And it was just, it was too tempting to achieve that, to not take it. And he doesn't regret it now, and I don't regret it. But, you know, it was just that, that one slightly too far. But he's probably my, you know, one of my closest friends. But also, I'm so proud of him because he was the one who made it against the odds. Like, you know, AJ won the Olympics. He was always kind of destined to fight for the world heavyweight title. This guy was never really supposed to win a world title. And, and it's great when you see those guys and you go up to their house and, you know, they open their electric gates and you see where they've come from and you just think, oh, that's the great thing about it. Darren Barker, another one. That's you know, what I thought you were going to say, yeah, Darren Barker. Who, who that, was that picture of you in Atlantic City when Darren won the, like, the world championship? I, that's probably the most excited I've ever seen you in a, in a particular moment. Yeah, but that's, you know, you, you miss those moments and they come far, because now we're doing so many fight nights, mm -hmm. it's very rare that you get that moment where, your guy, I mean, you see if Liam Williams wins tonight, all his lot will go nuts. And that's the kind of feeling you get. That was the same with Barker when he boxed Gill. You know, we we're in Atlantic City, got in the ring. It was so close. And I just thought, we're not going to get this. And, and Michael Buffer just said, and the new. And it was like, and when Kel Brook beat Sean Porter, you know, in LA, same kind, same kind of feeling. The emotions just run wild. But the most pleasing thing is when you see a fighter retire who's content. You know, like Barker was never really in love with the training and the sport. And he sits at home with his world championship on the wall, <laughs> you know, in his nice house and sort of says, ah, oh, I've done it. Yeah. You know, Bell, you the same. People that can look back. Because it's sad when you see a guy that might look back with regrets and think, I didn't really achieve what I should have or could have achieved. You know, maybe like a, like a Ricky Hatton or someone like that who might have a few regrets about, oh, maybe I should have taken it a bit more seriously. And there's other guys that probably could have achieved more, but they're happy anyway. I mean, Prince Nazim. I think he's a great example of that, who was, a, was a, I guess, a pound for pound great. But, you know, away from the Kevin Kelly win, Barrera was the fight and he just couldn't get over the line. But he wasn't really in love with it at that stage either. What I love about Canelo Alvarez and those kind of guys and AJ is a lot of these fighters, and absolutely rightly so, come from very humble beginnings, make money, get comfortable, get that dream life. And they're not the same fighter. That's what should happen. The greats are the ones that get all the things they ever dreamed of and want it even more than they ever did when they had nothing. Canelo Alvarez, Anthony and Joshua work harder now than they did when they started. That's a winner. You know, that's a competitor. That's, that's a great fighter. And I love those people because they're few and far between. But generally, the rule is in boxing, get in, have success, create legacy, get your money and get out as soon as you can. And you only ever come back when you need to come back and you need the money. And that's what you're seeing now with the legend stuff. Oscar don't want to fight again. He just wants the money. Mm. You think Mike Tyson wants to fight? You know, Evander Holyfield, they're sitting there going, wow, this is unbelievable. I can make 10 million, 20 million. I don't blame them, but it's up to people in boxing in certain cases that they need to look at those guys and go, Holyfield shouldn't be in a ring. Mike Tyson should, you know, should not be in a ring. So... Anyway. And, and you look, I mean, the example is two great fighters that can think, of, think from the 80s. Marvin Hagler, who retired in 1987, walked away from what could have been tens of millions of dollars for the rematch that Ray Leonard begged for, begged him. Ray won the fight and was begging for the rematch. He's someone that should be looked up as an example. Larry Holmes, another guy. I remember Larry Holmes, I'll never forget this, how he operates in Easton, Pennsylvania. He works in the Larry Holmes office in the Larry Holmes building on Larry Holmes Drive. Like that <laughs> is that he just saved his money throughout the years, retired, and was content when it was Andre awesome. Ward, another guy who yeah. could have come back for big yeah. bucks. I mean, he also had injuries, Andre yeah. Ward, but he was really a guy that basically said the money's not really there for what I think I deserve, so I'm done. You know, I tried to coax him back a few times for, <laughs> for several fights, and I always was a hundred percent convinced he would fight again. Mm -hmm. But you know, same. I mean, even if you look at MMA, Khabib. You know, he's a baby, really. I mean, he's not really had the full uh, fights and repertoire of a career that you would expect a great. And he just went, no, I'm done. I, I, I admire that and I respect it. Because once the fire goes out, it's dangerous. You know, really dangerous. And that's when, you know, I, was talk I talked to fighters. Who was I talking to the other day? Uh, Luke Campbell was, a, was another guy. You know, I just said to him, do you want it anymore? He's like, yeah, I just, I don't know. I said, you just answered my question. You know, because if you want it, you say, yeah, and you don't hesitate. You know, at the moment you doubt yourself, the moment you, 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 Luke Campbell has got to reflect on that Ryan Garcia defeat. And if he says, I don't know if I want to do it anymore, over. But the moment he sits down on the couch and says, no, actually, 
I really want this. Well, a lot of guys at the end of fights in the, in the press conference room say, I'm retired, I'm done, that's yeah. it. And then two weeks later go, well, you know, I was caught up in the heat of the moment. It's tempting when there's another payday or mm -hmm. there's another opportunity. It's, always it's the people around them that need to say no. And, and actually, a fighter, it, it's really nice when a fighter goes, no, no, no. You know, that's me done. Who was it the other day? Carl Frampton. Mm -hmm. You know, he said, win or lose in this fight, I'm done. Gets beat. Bye, everybody. Thank you. I've had a great time. He will never, ever fight again. Right? Because I'm not so sure he would have quit if he lost. I think he, yeah, yeah, probably he might right. have fought Shakur right. in front yeah. of 50,000 yeah. in Belfast. And, yeah. But, um, you know, it's very difficult to walk away from a sport that's trying to pull you in. Yeah. But it, it's, it's a godfather. Yeah, it is. Try to get out of it. Yeah. Chris, how long have you been covering boxing? Uh, 15 years now. How probably? would you describe the state of boxing today compared to when you first started? You know, I, I cover, started covering it when it, it was falling out of the mainstream a little bit. I mean, it was right around Mayweather versus De La Hoya, which was a monster event, but you still were in an area where you weren't, you, you, were, you were talking about more fights you weren't seeing than fights that you were. And that's what's disappointing. Like, people ask why boxing has kind of fallen, at least in the U.S., has fallen out of the mainstream. It's because these big fights don't happen. I mean, in the 1980s, like, Leonard would fight Duran or Hearns, like, on a weekday, and the world would stop. Like boxing isn't boxing isn't irrevocably damaged. Like it just needs to have big fights and people will pay attention. Like newspapers, magazines. I work for Sports Illustrated. I'm not necessarily the dedicated boxing writer. I cover multiple sports. I cover basketball. But if there are big fights on a regular basis, they'd probably say to me, it's time for you to cover just boxing like, because the interest is there. It's all about fan interest and fan interest in boxing in the U.S. It's still very big, obviously, in the U.K. But in the U.S., it will come back. Uh, with a surge if there are big fights made on a consistent basis. You hear that? Yeah, no, I think he's right. And I think uh, the good news is, is there's a lot of investment from platforms and broadcasters. So we've got a chance. Once that dries up, the game's dead. But now, even with Triller coming in, it's great because it gives people a little kick up the bum like the zone mm. and goes, wow, we're in the right place. Do you know what I mean? But it all comes down to the product. People say, oh, boxing's dead, MMA. No, boxing, boxing has the history. It has the legacy. It has a much wider reach historically and globally than the sport of MMA. But MMA's fresh. It's delivering the bigger fights. They want that him against him, it gets made. And that's what we've got to try and do. And hopefully with its own global platform, we can start creating our own little UFC. And you, you seem to have adapted a little bit over the last couple of years in that, tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you're more interested in making the big fights than tying guys to contracts at this yeah, point. Because then. that was what the initial plan was. Yeah. You, know, you get the Tevin Farmers and, the, and these mm. good fighters tied to long-term contracts, but they're not in big fights. No. Now it seems like you're more, you know... I think when you are a disruptive brand like DAZN were, and now Triller are, you have to make an impression in the market. You have to come in, you have to spend money, you have to be disruptive. We've just got smarter. Mm. You know, I, I don't have to tie fighters down for years and years and years. I just have to make great fights. In fact, I don't even have to represent you. I just need to give my platform the best fights. And I think our schedule right now in the U.S. is the best schedule in U.S. boxing. And it has been probably for over a year now. I don't feel like the zone sometimes get the credit that they should do. But we're in a good place. We're balanced. We're comfortable. We're smarter. We're wiser. We haven't got as many obligations. And you know, Chris, when you, get, you sit down with a fighter and you try and lure him to your promotional outfit or your platform, the first thing you say is, I'll give you an easy one to start with mm. and then we'll go into a big fight. Who wants to see that? And we were guilty of that. Everyone's guilty of that. I mean, Charlo um, Montiel is another example of that where it's just like, we'll give you the easy one. We can't give you the easy one. If we have to lose guys because we're not prepared to give you the easy one, then that's what we have to do because the only one that gets it in the neck is me. Oh, what's this fight? What's a hard? Oh, should never have given him an easy one, should I? <laughs> and, and, you know, you've, I've had to be a little bit more firm. I think, in a way, COVID's kind of helped because it's given us an excuse yep, to go, I'm oh, sorry, you know, the, the, they don't want to see that fight. They want to see this fight. And if you want to fight, you've got to fight this guy. And if you don't want to fight that guy, then you can wait. You know, and uh, we need to be a little bit harder. Got a long way to go, but I feel like the schedule's great. And obviously, signing Canelo Alvarez and working with him has been... Huge for match room. He really likes you, he says. Yeah, we've got a great relationship. And um, I think that he's enjoying what we're doing. We deliver what we say we're going to deliver. It's nice and fresh. It's exciting. It's like any relationship, isn't it? You know, when you first start a relationship, it's, <laughs> it's so exciting. You know, you're going out on dates. You've got plenty to say. You know, and as you get 10 years down the line, you go for dinner and you're sort of both looking at your phone. 
Anyone else know that, please? Chris has never been on a date. He okay. doesn't understand yeah, how that yeah, works. Yeah. He's so just always Chris, looking at the phone. Chris has yeah. never been married, so he doesn't have to yeah, worry exactly. about it. Chris is okay. all right. Yeah. 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 All right, Chris, I'll give you the last word. Your final thoughts on the card tonight. What are you expecting? What are you hoping for? I'm just excited. I, I Look, I'm a huge Demetrius Andrade fan. I, I, I'm desperate for him to be in a big fight to see if he's as good as I think he is, as he thinks he is. Uh, I hope he puts on a show. I hope he goes out there and tries to make the kind of statement that we've been waiting for and calling for really for the last few years. If he has Liam Williams hurt, like he had Cowton Dockwer hurt, like he's had Luke Keeler hurt, like he had Selecki hurt, if he has him hurt, I hope he goes out and closes the show. And that will close our show. He is Chris Mannix alongside Eddie Hearn. Also, thank you to John David Jackson and our other guests today, including the Chechen Wolf. I'm Todd Grisham. Enjoy the fights tonight live from the Hard Rock Resort and Casino from Hollywood, Florida. And we appreciate you watching Before the Bell. Come on, guys.